Craig, welcome to 69 Faces of Rock. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I'm uh, I'm a little I'm a little uh I don't drink, but I'm a little hungover uh from hanging out at the uh Macedon Gojira uh, Lorna Shore show last night. Just being there late. We we actually closed the room down. Uh, it was a room, it's a giant. It's like a 13,000 capacity uh, the- uh open theater. But uh yeah, we hung out there with Braun last night, uh myself and Contos and Jared from Machine Head and a few other guys were just hanging out. Just talking, laughing, having a good time. So it was fun. Excellent. I still see that you have that wicked suburban look. That means you're good to go. Is that what that is? <laughs> well, that's what you told me years ago. Remember that story? Back no, from- remind me. Um, when I asked you about how did you end up being in, in one of those hard and heavy magazine promos? Oh. And, and you told me that they picked you because you had that wicked suburban look. <laughs> I was probably fucking around. Well, I, I think uh, it's so funny. I haven't thought about that forever. And if anyone knows, wants to know what Mark's talking about, the very first hard and heavy video, uh, the home video, something that was a VCR tapes that they used to release back in those days. But they uh, did interviews with all kinds of bands. And they interviewed Forbidden in Long Beach at Fenders when we played with Voivod and Violence. And for some, some reason, which I still am confused, so they, they picked me to go down to LA and do a little acting job as a kid who's because I thought I, I they thought I was young enough because I was I was 18 at the time or I might have been no I might have just turned 19 but uh to go down and be, have parent fake parents and do this whole scene I it's like some sort of bourbon house where this is it, it was silly I look back at it now I'm like holy shit like you know I, I was I, yeah back I was I was drinking like a lot back then as a kid so like this pudgy drinking uh cocky kid i guess that's what they were looking for well that's what they got anyway so let's, they got. <laughs> let's, let's get down to business so how did forbidden re-enter your orbit again man by accident really uh or by design in a way that was outside of my uh you know uh, conscious view of things because i honestly and you know, I've been having to repeat myself on this, obviously doing interviews. But I got to say, uh, I truly thought it was going to never really happen again. I was uh, okay with that too. I didn't have regrets about it. Um, Could have lived the rest of my life without it. You know, with, without Russ, I just figured it was just never going to happen. He is absolutely living another life, very quiet, retired, living with a sponsor, alcoholic sponsor, you know, AA sponsor. Uh, supporting you on another through that you know what i mean and that's a big deal a lot of guys in this business uh stay alcoholics for their whole lives you know um and russ uh, it was either choose life or you know death i mean it was really coming down to that so i just said no it won't happen and uh and when i started doing the bay area international rehearsals that we did we brought something we brought to europe where we had a bunch of other musicians uh, play these thrash metal uh, origin songs, but uh, but you couldn't play your own song. The whole deal is you can't play your own song. You had, so when Death Angel was there, they were watching guys from Forbidden and you know Lamb of God and, and uh, just everybody's playing their shit. You know what I mean? And vice versa. So, but uh, when we were here rehearsing, I realized, oh shit, we don't have any of the singers that are going to be with us um, on stage at Dynamo. So we better get somebody out here. So I was talking to Chris Contos about it, and he goes. Why don't you give Norman Skinner a call? Oh, yeah, he's really good. Shit, yeah, that guy's good. I'll give him a call. And uh, so we did, and he was ripping through the other songs. And then I just said, uh, this is all true, by the way. This is not, there's no embellishment here. I, I said, well, let's go run through Off the Edge since it's going to be played out there. And then as soon as we started playing the song, and I, and I had with me in that moment, uh, Steve Smythe, Matt Camacho, myself, and then Mark Hernandez was the Omega Wave lineup of guys. And, and, and then I had Norman Skinner. And I realized, why am I playing this? None of us are going to be playing this. I, I started the song as like, okay, you know, Matt started it. I was like, all right, we'll just, I guess we'll just run, run through it. And I hadn't even practiced it, you know, but it's in my DNA. So, but uh, we started and then, and then Norman's like, okay, you know, he grabbed the mic. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll do that one. And, uh, he fucking nailed it. It was like, it was shocking. As soon as he started singing, the door opens and it's real slow because everyone's in the hallway. And then Chris Contos just looks in and he's like, 
and they see Harold's head pop up over him. He's like, oh. And so they close the door real quick. And I was like, yeah, I hear it. But I didn't think it was going to happen. And um, it was really good. I was like, that was really fun. And um, fast forward to after we got back from Europe and we did all those shows, we had to get ready for another one. And, and my idea was to have uh, Warbringer do Chalice of Blood with Norman Skinner singing. And we could just sit back and watch that happen. So uh, we don't practice it at all. But then we end up going to the rehearsal. So I didn't do the same thing because I knew I didn't have to play it. I'm not, I'm not going to fucking do that song, but I'm going to play it. So uh, the guys at Warbringer show up to the rehearsal in San Francisco at SIR. And uh, Norman's there and they go into it. And as soon as he starts singing, all the eyes in the room turned and looked at me. You know, they all just turned around like, I'm like I, I, I hear it. I know. I know he's good. So I didn't even see it there. So we did the show. It was incredible watching them do it. And it happened again. I'm standing on the side of the stage. And then all the people are looking at me like, do you see it? Like, I see it. I hear it. And uh, it really wasn't something I was going to do until we got the the email from Alcatraz. And they just, it was so funny because it was worded in a way that, that essentially the Cliff's notes of it were, do you want to play? Uh, this year's Alcatraz Festival for a 35th anniversary exclusive European show. Anthrax has to drop out. Uh, we'll put you in their spot. And could you please, or would you be interested in doing it with another singer since Russ is going through, you know, uh, what he's going through? And could you ask Chris Consos to play drums? Because I think that makes a great story. And this is my friend Mario, who is the promoter. And I was like, I just looked at the email and I I literally looked at the email and went back like this. And I called my manager and I go, dude, the universe is telling us we got to do this. You know, I'm like, I think we have to explore at least doing this show. And that's where it all started. And I made the phone calls, but uh, it was the first phone call was the Matt. The next phone call was, to, and he's like, of course, I've been waiting for this call. The next phone call was to Steve. He's like, yeah, I really want to do this. And then the next phone call was to Norman, who's like, he didn't even hesitate. He's like, yep. I got, yep. You know, because we're his favorite band, favorite thrash band, first thrash concert he went to. Russ used to call him Little Russ from the stage. Um, and little did Russ know that he's going to end up being, and he played shows with us. Like when Forbidden came back, uh, he played two different shows with us in two different venues and two different times uh, in around 2000. 10 and again in 2012 he played our last local show uh at the avalon which i was actually 13 years ago today so i gotta i gotta post that flyer i should post that because it's 13 years ago today so he played that show so there was all there and we just didn't have a drummer situation because uh mark had uh, actually quit forbidden in 2011 when we were on tour and we had to cancel an entire european tour so you know his life is not really um applicable to going on the road for long periods of time and stuff like that so you know i knew that i wasn't going to rely on him for that and uh we had to find another drummer and i look i talked to some pretty heavy cats dude i i reached out to some really good guys and i you know don't want to drop a bunch of names but they're all interested but the scheduling and whatnot and then i talked to chris contos and i go dude we already played the boneless ones would you at least be interested in entertaining the idea of maybe doing this? And we were both very uh, guarded about doing it because we are such good friends and we didn't want to fuck anything up. So he originally just gave me other names. And then a few days later, I'm like, okay, I'm going to look into this more, but I'm going to ask you one more time. Is this something we should be exploring? And then he thought about it. He's all, fuck yeah, dude. He's like, let's, let's write a fucking killer thrash record. And, and that's what I need right now. I need that kind of enthusiasm and intelligence and and wisdom and so chris is a really good uh, uh piece for this this version of forbidden i really feel like it's his, he's been setting his life up for this as i've been setting mine up for this excellent so norman skinner how does he fit it with you guys on personal level oh seamlessly he's really really smart uh really measured in his words he'll say he, the shit he says is really funny like he's not going to say like he'll He's perfect because he doesn't like sit in there and interject himself and I'm I, I matter. Blah, blah, blah. It's nothing like that. He's very humble. He's got his own career, dude. People love him. Once, uh, you know, I mean, 
this, once this news went out, you, if you look, if you scan through the reactions, uh, besides the people that don't know who he is, everyone that does is all, he's perfect. You know what I mean? He fits. He's fucking works hard. He's very talented. You know, he's smart. He, he, he's a good dude. That's most of and that's the most important thing is uh, at this stage of my career, you know, um, you've got to have all five fingers of the fist working together, mm-hmm. you know, and and he's he wants to work really closely with me and wants to do the, you know, he knows that I write most of the lyrics in Forbidden and, and Melodies will work together closely on that stuff. So he wants that. He's like, show me how your formula works. Show me what you do. You know, and I'm looking forward to working with him on that level because he's like an open book. And that's not easy to come by. People get very rigid and settled yeah. in their in their own little way. And he's like, no, you know, take me to thrash school because he's more of a power metal guy traditionally, classic metal, power metal. But he's got a great thrash voice and scratch and all the all the shit that Russ had. But you know, no one will ever be. Russ. No, I mean, I shouldn't say all the shit because Russ had gears that no one else had besides guys like Halford, and he had a few gears beyond that because Halford never tried to really sing thrash. So, you know, Russ was a special, special guy, Norman special in his own way. It's just going to be a little bit different, you know, like Maiden switching from Deanna to Dickinson or Ozzy coming out of Sabbath and Dio coming in. It's just going to be that kind of thing. People are going to be skeptical as they should be, quite honestly. I, I don't see why it's you know if you don't know who he is and you're not aware i could totally understand why you'd be skeptical but we already know so have at it we already know are you it's actively not, not still in touch with with ross how is how is he doing he's good you know uh he avoided my phone call for a while uh because he i talked to his sister often and she's like more of his communicator now because he's trying to really stay away from music I mean, he, but she said that he was just nervous i was going to ask him to join the band again you know, and I was like, no, like I already know he already he already gave us his blessing years ago. He said, if you're going to do it, do it again. You know, I wish I could, but I, I just can't. You know, and I told him I'd never do it without you until until Norman came along. I fully believe that. You know, so uh, never say never. I've learned, but some things just seem impossible. You know. Yeah, I mean, you've achieved impossible. That one clip I saw, I'm thinking there is potential there. Mm. Yeah. No, very much. Um, Chris Cantos, you mentioned him already. Um, how would you describe the dynamic between the two of you? Like two, it's like an old. Oh, he jokes around. It's like an old married couple because we 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 we're so we just, just always click. We're funny. Uh, we got a lot of jokes. You know, it was great last night. I got to go back to last night hanging out with Braun, who's. If anyone knows Ron, they know how intelligent he is. Like Ron is very, very smart, and and he loves clowns, and he's just got this whole dark sense of humor. So we ended up chopping it up last night. It was so great because between the three of us, it was like I think Ron was like kind of looking around, like "Whoa, guys that can keep up with me," you know? Like we were just getting it was pretty deep dark humor that I think was flying over the heads and some of the people around us. It's pretty cool. So Chris and I have that, and. uh and we wrote the Boneless Ones record with the guys from the Boneless Ones, you know, legacy punk rock band, super important in the skate rock world. And we made a really great, great record. I mean, that was something we did together. And that was the first time we really wrote an entire thing together. And I knew that was amazing. Um, you know, it's skate rock, so it's got its own little niche, but it's it's an, it's a great record. So um, I never really got to write thrash, full on thrash metal with them, though. So this is going to be cool because we are going to lean into it. Thrash metal. I want to do a lot of this album in E. I'm telling people that because I, I, I intend on writing it in the key that we wrote our first two records in. Not completely. I do want to mix it up, but I want a lot of songs to bounce and have that E excitement. You know, because if your riff, if your song's heavy in E, it'll be heavy in any key. And you know, like the old shit, we had to write it. We weren't thinking about tuning down. We were just writing the best stuff we could. And it was heavy and it was, you know, if you could make it sound evil and you don't have to tune down to do it. You're doing all right. Keep it evil. Um, prior to Forbidden's return, you are playing with Dress the Dead. What is the status of that band now? Well, I mean, obviously, I can't do too much at the moment, but we have new music we're going to release that we recorded. We've been putting it off. I think it's a good time to put it out very soon now because we're going to need a little bridge. But, I mean, it's at this point, it's, you know, 
it's on ice for a minute. I, I just don't, you know, my singer lives in Portland. So that causes enough of a problem just getting together, you know, but she's a fucking amazing singer, very talented. I think uh, Kayla's a star in the making. And, you know, if she doesn't do it with Dress of Dead, she's going to do it somewhere else. And she's going to be a star. And I, I have nothing but uh, great respect for her and uh, her youth and talent is, is unmatched. I've been, I've been very lucky. I've been blessed. Um, and she's one of the greatest singers I've ever come across in my life. And I've made music with her. And, uh, just like Russ, you know, and, and just like Skinner now, it's going to be a new chapter. I don't know exactly when we're going to relaunch Stress the Dead, but I hope to, you know. And originally it was Peter Dolving, uh, who was, was the singer from The Haunted. And that didn't last long because, you know, he had things going on in, in Denmark that he needed to attend to. So, but it was it was fun. It, 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 and I just don't know exactly when it's going to re-hit again. But the, I do know the new music is going to come out within a couple of months here. So uh, we've got a four song EP that we did. And uh, we're going to put that five, actually five songs, put that out. So how did you put yourself together back in that forbidden state of mind? Because there is a forbidden state of mind. I've spent enough time around you guys to know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm in the process still. I, you know, I can't say I'm like, I'm in the middle of, uh, I did the jump and I haven't stuck the landing yet. Right. I got to still stick the landing. But I have full confidence in in everyone in this this version of the band. You know, they're all really good. Even Matt Camacho turned into an incredible bass player, unbeknownst to everybody. He worked harder than anyone and just sat there and, you know, worked on techniques and he loves bass, you know. So that's my wingman. Matt's my guy. You know, he's there since 1986. So he's the only last original member with me, right? So this forbidden state of mind kind of for me and him will just be natural occurrence. I don't need to think about it too hard. It just it just is what it is. It's funny, dude. I'll tell you, Mark, you know, everyone's got an opinion and I expect that and I respect that. But, you know, why didn't you get this guy? What's why why did not that guy? It's not this without that. It's not, you know, everyone's got these things they're gonna say. That shit really doesn't bother me because I already know. Mm -hmm. But there's only one guy who's been in the band since the inception, and that's me. And I've seen it all happen. I've seen these people come and go. And um, everyone served an incredible purpose. You know, everyone served uh, the songs or whatever at the time in, in great ways, you know, from the very beginning, from Bo Staff to Alvalize to Calvert to Jacobs, you know, to after that, it was, uh, you know, Smythe and Hernandez. And, uh, you know, we, we went to even as far as Sasha. You know, for that's now an ex hoarder, you know, who's great, great, great drummer, but he's an ex hoarder. So he, he lives in New Mexico. All these people are wonderful, but you have to get along. You have to, you have to have the chemistry together where there's no grinding. And uh, that was, that's another part of the forbidden state of mind that not everyone was on, on board with all the time. Sometimes this shit just got grinding. So it has to be the good, right amount or combination of people to make forbidden 2023 and beyond work. We have that. Excellent. Now, yesterday when I got the press release uh, when about the rebirth of the band, I felt very excited. I posted it in several places, like the video and the press release. And then I went back and looked at the comments. Most of them, people are super happy, super excited. But there were a few of those people who hesitate. Oh, it's not going to be the same. Or, or, or one or two can't happen without Ross. How do you plan on winning over those people? I don't really plan on it. I just know we're going to. I mean, you're not going to win over everybody. You know? Oh, you, whoa, 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 what was that? Okay. That was loud. Something something happened there. Like a paper. Oh, it was like a so loud noise. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not going to win over everybody. And I don't expect to win over everybody. And I don't really care to win over everybody. There's going to be some people that are... Uh, and I, I just alluded to this in my last comment. I mean, you know, um, you're never going to make everyone happy. But I will say that the people who already know Skinner are already like a thousand percent in because they already know. So, you know, there's just a certain amount of easy confidence to this that we just know already because we did it. We, we we know how he works. It'll, you know, you're either gonna you're either gonna be mad that Ozzy left Black Sabbath or you're gonna be happy that Dio did a really great job when he got in too. So you can choose to be whatever kind of person you want to be. Uh 
I believe the definition of that kind of person that hates everything that's new is a curmudgeon. You know, I mean, I'm, I've never been a curmudgeon. I, I accept uh, that things do change, and I just want the best of my favorite artists, what they can give. You know, sometimes it just it's not good. Sometimes it's just not good, and that happens too. It doesn't always work out. Nothing you can do about that. Another small, tiny group uh, said that, oh, you guys are just trying to cash in. And I'm thinking, I spend a lot of time around you guys, and I know you put in a lot of effort, time, and money into building this brand, right? Yes. So I'm thinking, all right, what's wrong with getting paid and having a blast at the same time? Nothing. This is a very hard business to make any money in at all. Sure. Uh, it, 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 and it's even more difficult now. If people don't realize how hard it is to bring your shit onto the road, survive in a period of time, the price of fuel, the price of flights, you know, your your all your passports and your visas and then your gear and your, you just have no idea with with music being basically given away for free. You know, the, your live situation is, is where you're supposed to make some money in the merchandise and things like that. To survive doing this, people people are, I mean, there's no nice way to put it. Most people are clueless. Some people are just assholes, you know, and they don't understand. And I don't really, <clears throat> where other people get jaded about all this stuff, I don't. And that's why I still do it. And that's why I've survived creating my own art, not worrying about if it gets big. If I, I, I don't care, dude. But I do know that Forbidden's like, it has its place in history. Like we're not, a, we're not a big band. We're a cult band, uh, but we're a cult band that influenced countless other bands. So there's a, there's an army of peers of people with bigger bands that are going to be just as excited as any kid or that never got to see us or older person that, that loved the band from back then. So there's something like the collective conscious kind of, it's the right time for the band. And, you know, like I said, the universe opened up. I had to acknowledge it. Um, so I think the timing's pretty good. I think people are going to be super happy on all sides of it. Yeah. I mean, both of us are certain age and we have certain responsibilities to life and you see some of these comments and it's obviously made by someone who still lives in their parents' basement, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's, it feels like that, you know, but I mean, people are people dude. I, I just, I just can't, can't spend one second worrying about what anyone else thinks when they're, well, the priority for us is real simple. Uh, get to know each other as a band again. Uh, rehearse the hell out of the songs we're going to do for Europe. And then start come back home and start writing a record. And then prepare for the next group of shows, which nothing is announced yet. You know, I think 2024 is going to be the majority of where everything happens. I think 2023 has got to be really spent concentrating on, you know, uh, gelling and writing and preparing for an album that people will be able to sink their teeth into for years to come. It has to be the priority. It, it can't be chasing people's dreams or touring extensively with no new record out. It just has to be all well-timed special moments that drop, you know, at the right time. We can't do everything. We can't go to every market without a record out. And even with a record out, I don't see it being lucrative to do that. I Sadly, you have to pick big moments. And that's my business model for this new version of Forbidden. You had been an active musician for pretty much nonstop. Um, and you, you write music, you write riffs. Are there any Forbidden riffs that have been kind of popping out here and there over the years? Sure, yeah. A lot of shit that I wrote for Dress the Dead could have easily been a Forbidden riff. And people don't realize how heavy we were or are, I should say, but how heavy all that music is. Uh, they don't know, because they're like, oh, he's doing something different. It's not like this and that. But there's some thrashy stuff that goes on those records. I'm not going to pull that stuff out, but I, I have plenty of riffs I've compiled over the years. But I'm going to take a different approach to writing this record, Mark, and it's going to be a very cool one for me, because I'm going to come up with what I want to sing about, what I want to talk about, what I want the story to be for each song, before some riffs will just happen like they always do you sit down you write riffs but i want to convince visualize and convey i'm trying to put two words together can can visualize can visualize but i want to do something different and really put pieces together to make uh, a visual 
oral story for everything. And um, and I'm I'm older now, and I have the kind of hindsight to to be able to do that, you know. So I want to have an idea for each song before I really get into writing the song. And uh, already I've I've started writing lyrics. Um, that's the first thing I do. I feel like the world now is all those forbidden subjects we used to talk about. So many of those things prophetically are have happened or in the middle of happening, you know. So we were a band that you know dealt with duality and and good versus evil and the battle of the mind and yin and yang and you know the two skulls crashing is like kind of essentially what it's always been and um i still wrestle with those same things so i'm looking forward to writing lyrics that lean into that you know um one former band member who unfortunately won't make any guest appearances tim calvert of course sadly tim is no longer with us uh what memories do yeah. you have of tim uh during his time in forbidden Well, he was probably the funniest guy anyone ever knew. Tim was Tim was funny and dark. He had a very dark sense of humor. And uh, uh, my memories of him was he was uh, the greatest uh, writing partner a, a guy could have. You know, he came from a, a, a classic metal, you know, kind of Queensryche and, and stuff like that school. So he didn't really have any thrash background when we started playing together. So he he had to catch that right hand up, you know. But but yet his ideas were great. So we just we just locked in, and I and I loved playing with him. And it was great while it was great. And then it got a little towards the end, you know, when nothing was happening for the band and we were all struggling. Tim did get bitter and um, and resentful. And then when the band broke up, he was, felt like it was very non ceremonious, and he and he felt betrayed by it. So he's always it was really sad because we we tried to connect. But he was always kind of resentful because I called it, you know, when I called it. You know, uh, that I wish that could, I wish there was a way to make up for that. But I've come to terms with it, and um, you know, I'll always love him, always, always, always. And I know he loved me too, but he, I think he's just really frustrated that the band broke up and after he put so much time into it. But you know, he wasn't the only one who put time into it. Everybody did. So you know, it's just it just happens to bands, and I just think he. He felt very dissatisfied, and uh, you know, I feel bad about that. But like I said, I've had to come to terms with it. Um, when you look back in the past, uh, what would you consider band's biggest achievement, or what are you the most happiest about? Uh, well, there's different kinds of achievements, right? I mean, there's the achievement of of writing records that stand the test of time, uh, which nobody thought would. You know, you don't, you're not thinking they will when you're writing them. And, you know, uh, the first two records are considered classics. And then the other ones were considered sleepers because nobody was paying attention. And then later they paid attention. They're like, whoa, I missed that. That was cool. And then Omega Wave was a roaring comeback. You know, some people didn't catch it in the moment, but we were already broken up by the time that came out to the, came around to their 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 view. And then so uh, I think all those are great achievements for different reasons, different things, especially in the dark days of metal to put those two albums out, you know, Distortion Green where there's like nobody paying attention to thrash metal bands. Like it was impossible to get any attention. And then of course shows, you know, individual shows that first dynamo we played was will always be a golden memory in my mind. And, and many of the festivals over the years and just playing Chicago was great. I remember playing, uh, was it the cubby bear? Then coming back around playing Medusa's, you know, like, you know, just like a classic show. I remember being in Chicago, uh, playing with death angel and looking outside upstairs at, at the line it was going around and around i was like holy crap you know oops sorry my oh, my uh, computer died as part of my light here <laughs> so yeah so i just i remember these i couldn't pick out just one or two just so many yeah um also you have a very loyal fan base and as you mentioned many of these former fans are now in, in big bands uh that's got to be very rewarding yes. Yeah, it's cool, man. Um, you know, Paul obviously is is uh, he was in Slayer for all those years, and now he's doing the Carrie King project that nobody seems to know much about. But that's going to be a thing, you know. And he's concentrating on that. So yeah, no, I'm 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 stoked for anyone I've played with that's uh, like I said, I, I cheer for success, man. I cheer for success. I'm not a hater. I don't sit back and you know boo anything or jeer or you know, thumb my nose at stuff that people are succeeding at. 
I may not like all the music everyone does, but if you're succeeding at it, I have more power to you, man. Yeah. Finally, what are you looking forward to and, and hoping to achieve with the current rebirth? Longevity. Uh, I'm in, you know, my early fifties now. I started this shit when I was 15. So if we could milk this into 10 years of quality time together, quality shows, a couple albums in that time, you know, at least two I'd like to get out. And uh, then I, you know, I'm getting into my sixties. I, I, <laughs> it's, I don't know what's going on. You know, you see it happening now. These bands are in their sixties play, playing in it uncharted territory for thrash guys to get this old and, and do this shit but the kids do seem to appreciate the sincerity of this older thrashers more than they appreciate the younger thrashers it's it, and you know back in the day when you got 25 people are like, you're getting old you know you're gonna miss your window it's like that's obviously gone you know like people are, are way more open to uh older bands bring in it bring in the the school you know school with them so i i look forward to just the the whole process of uh having this be a real positive experience with five guys that are into it i mean what more could i ask for than having everyone be excited and working together and that'll make a better band that'll make a better version of forbidden this time well thank you and wishing you a lot of luck and a lot of intense shows as they were back in the day Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's good to see you on uh see your face. I haven't seen you in person in a long time. So I think the last time I saw you in person was what, 2011? 11, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's been 12 years. Yeah, I'll see you and uh Sean Sean Glasshole and all the boys eventually. Got that? <laughs> the whole crew will be there. Right on. Well, thanks so much for your time, man. I, I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to talk to you.